Okay, I'm going to start 30 seconds early. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is our annual, I'm sorry, our, our weekly energy symposium. Uh, a couple of admin remarks. First of all, next week is Dr. Varun Rai, a professor over in the LBAJ school. He had a really fancy title that he's going to talk about, and I can't remember it, so I'm not going to try to repeat it. But Varun always speaks quite eloquently. Uh, he's done a lot of research in renewable energies, particularly solar PV, adoption rates of solar PV, uh, you know, dynamic intersocial aspects of how people adopt EV, why they do it, and how that trend spreads throughout neighborhoods through uh, word of mouth and whatnot. I don't know if that's what he's talking on, but it'll be something not too far removed from that. But uh, Varun's always a great guy to have. He actually ran this class for three or four years, so please be sure to turn up for that. Uh, also, this evening after our talk, Michael has agreed to join us to continue the discussion after the talk this evening. So we'll probably go over to Varsity again and continue the discussion over there over some beer and pizza, and it's a beautiful evening to sit outside and enjoy that kind of stuff. So please join us if you'd like to over there. Uh, we'll probably be over there about 15 minutes after we break up here. We should be able to get over that direction. So I normally do this ad lib, but before I introduce Michael, and I was reading some of his bio, I thought I knew him. I certainly don't, clearly don't know him as well as I thought I did, but I've got to read this. This is pretty impressive. He's been a programmer for over 25 years, works in energy, financial, medical, neuroscience research, and educational sectors. He's got far more degrees than I do. He's got an MA and a PhD, PhD in clinical health psychology, neuropsychology from the Furkoff Graduate School. He's got an MS and PhD in energy systems engineering from my favorite school, the University of Texas at Austin, and he's a certified performance technologist. Uh, what I, and he worked for several years also at ERCOT. So if anybody's part of the local Central Texas ecosystem in energy, Michael's one of them. He's one of the usual suspects. You go to any one of these kind of events or something else going around Central Austin with regards to energy, he's there most often because he's deeply involved, deeply vested, and deeply passionate about energy and the energy ecosystem. And what I find fascinating about the work he does is, unlike a, a simple engineer or physicist like me who I think if I design the perfect thing, everybody will love it, he realizes that now people, people are more complex than that. And we do not put near enough thought into the design of our energy systems and our energy networks with regards to how people are going to use them. Uh, I don't know precisely what he's going to get into today, so I'm not going to try to steal his thunder, but clearly we've designed our grid just to accommodate whatever people want to do. By really trying to work with the way people interact with the energy systems and the energy devices they use and try to use that insight and knowledge to gain some resilience and measures of efficiency. I think he's going to give us a talk that will be very compelling, talking about some of what can be done by studying how people interact with the system and what more can be done to improve the systems as we go forward. So with that, Michael, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, can I just uh, ask, you can all hear me in the back OK with the mic? OK, great. Sorry? Uh, weird echo. Weird echo? Okay, sorry. I'll try to talk a little quieter or do something. Um, just out of curiosity, by show of hands, how many of you are in the EER program, just so I can get to know you? Great. Any um, uh, engineer, um, electrical, mechanical? Okay. Um, LBJ? Great, welcome. Any other groups I missed? Oh, McCombs, excuse me. <laughs> Communications, welcome. It's great to have you here. Anyone else I missed? Economics, Economics excellent. Oh, wonderful. Welcome. Um, well, great. So I'm going to feel uh, a little bit bad doing this with such um, a smart crowd, but I'm really going to start, if you don't mind, if you'll permit me, with kind of a dumb question. Baseball and a bat together cost $11. The bat is $10 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Real simple. Anyone? Dollar? Right? How many of you think a dollar? You guys already know it's a trick question, right? OK. Most people do, especially if I were holding up a you know, $20 bill, first person to answer. Um, we'd you know, be motivated to respond very quickly. A dollar, right? That's our first thought. It's such a weird question that you know that uh, I'm probably throwing you a curveball. And in fact, the answer is actually half a dollar. So why does this happen? This is just a very simple example of the kind of mistakes that we make. We're using mental shortcuts 
to try to accelerate our functioning. And usually in most situations that really helps us. If we had to effortfully think about everything we do, we'd never get anything done. But sometimes those shortcuts lead us astray. Now, also I know we've got some engineers in the room. I'm sure the ER people would know this as well. Imagine you've got a circuit breaker, let's say 500,000 volts running through it at, I don't know, 500 megawatts. Pretty heavily loaded breaker. And an operator sends a command to open that breaker. What starts to happen? Plates move apart, and what do you get as you have a gap between those two plates? What do you get? Plasma. What's that? Plasma. Plasma, an arc. How many of you kind of know about this idea? You've ever unplugged your vacuum cleaner and you see that little spark? How many of you recognize that that's dangerous? Any of you heard it, or seen it? So how many of you have looked at those electrons and thought, wow, that's kind of dangerous. I'm glad I'm not in the middle of that. Probably many of you, right? How many of you have looked at those electrons and thought, wow, those electrons are lazy. Those electrons are complacent. Anyone? That would be kind of odd. You know, there's usually one in the crowd who raises their hand anyway, but that's kind of odd, right? We know intuitively that's wrong. Kind of like if I were to tell you, you go to your, you know, um, to your parents' house for Thanksgiving, and after a lovely meal, you put down a $100 bill on the table and you say, that was lovely, here, please. We all know that's wrong, right? But part of the point I'll try to cover today is that some of the things that we do in our organizations, when you really think about it, are like that. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, and it certainly doesn't set us up for the outcomes that we want. So I'll give you a very quick um, intro about who I am and how I got to be here. Um, many years ago, um, all of you who are graduate students have probably experienced the uh, laundry problem, which is basically you've run out of clean clothes. So I was working on my dissertation in psychology, living right up there-ish in New York, and uh, took down the big baskets, you know, down in my apartment building, started loading up the washer, moving stuff to the dryer, and as I'm putting the last stuff into the dryer, thinking about my wife who's working downtown in Manhattan which looked about like that. Put the last quarter in, push in the tray, and the lights go out. I'm like, oh, crap. I just blew a breaker or fuse, messed it all up. Actually, the day was August 14th, 2003. And for those of you who might remember, that's the Northeast blackout. So yes, I kind of am responsible for that blackout, just in a teeny tiny little way. So looking at it from space, you can see some pretty significant um, impacts. I spent the evening at, um, I happened to be fortunate enough to live a few miles away from our emergency operations center. And I'm a ham radio guy, as if I'm not enough of a nerd already. And so I spent the night at the emergency operations center relaying communications. How many of you have seen the movie The Sixth Sense? Bruce Willis, right? Okay. There's that moment, and for those of you who haven't seen it, I don't want to ruin it where you figure out who Bruce Willis really is, and the temperature in the room feels to drop 20 degrees. You guys know what I'm talking about? For me, that moment was that night when we got the call that there was a children's hospital with a kid on an operating table, two kids on life support, two backup generators, one offline for maintenance, and one overheating. They had about hmm, 45 minutes before that generator went off, and three kids could lose their lives. That was my moment, and that's what it felt like. So several months later, when NERC and FERC came out with the root cause analysis, trying to understand how it was possible that this entire region could be blacked out, most of the factors were actually human factors. One in particular, the operators lost what these people don't have, situational awareness. So what ended up happening was that you had a lot of operators who didn't understand what the big picture was. So they were making decisions based on what they knew to be correct, except what they knew to be correct was wrong. And ultimately, that led to that blackout. So we've got lots of technical definitions for what situational awareness is. If you're interested, I'd suggest you can look it up more. I'd rather talk to you, um, also talk to you a little bit about those stages. So, you know, very high level, what's going on, what does it mean? and where is it going, or what, so what, and now what. 
And it's also important for that situational awareness to happen both within an individual and within a team. But I'd rather talk to you about what situational awareness is not. If you look at root cause analyses in the industry, most of them aren't actually root cause analyses. They're what you'd call apparent cause analyses. Usually it's human error. This particular person screwed up. Okay, we figured out what was wrong. Let's move on. You know, let's sweep it under the carpet and not worry about it. Well, actually, when you start to dig, you'll find very, very quickly that it's almost never a single individual human being who makes a mistake in a vacuum. There's usually a lot more going on. And so when you start to dig deeper, you'll find that things like loss of situational awareness is a lot more than just one person not knowing what's going on. So let me kind of leave you with this quote. I think it kind of aligns everything that I do and everything I hope that you'll take away from this. If every organization is perfectly aligned to the results they're getting and they don't like their results, maybe they need to change their alignment. And we also need to look at human error differently, at it's a result of a mismatch between what human beings are capable of and what they're being expected to do, and nothing more. So in this line of work, it's particularly important. In my particular area of research, which is the, um, you know, the bulk power system, it turns out that getting these things right is critically important. Um, a few years ago, the White House identified, basically asked the question, what are all of the critical infrastructures out there? And after they did that, they figured out that energy and communications are the two most critical of all of the critical infrastructures. Because without either one of those, all of the other ones fail. Oh, and by the way, energy and communications are so intimately tied that if either one fails, the other one will go down as a result. So when we typically think about these critical systems, you know, we'll talk about, for example, um, the bulk power system on the electric side, natural gas pipelines, getting water all over the place, telecoms, cybersecurity, and so forth. But what I would say to you today and ask you to think about is that all of these industries have something in common, which is human beings. Those individuals, those teams, those groups, and the people with their computers are all interacting nonstop. So really, at the end of the day, if you can bring down a power grid because of a human error, maybe we need to focus on the human error part of the equation, not just the power grid part of the equation. And at the end of the day, at least in the electric world, you can also look at electricity consumption as a whole as just scaled up human behavior, right? How many of you increase your energy usage when you make the choice to turn on the light? We all do, right? How many of us increase energy usage on the grid when we download that new app that's talking to that cloud server somewhere that's running computations for us? We all do. How many of us affect the grid every time we turn on our air conditioner because it's cold or our heater because it's hot? All of those things are just scaled up human behavior. And just in the same way, it's human beings who are sitting in all these control rooms trying to understand what's going on and trying to make the best decisions. So as you're looking at an organization, and by the way, I'm trying to just breeze through this sort of very high level view. So if there are any things you find interesting or want me to dig deeper into, please feel free to interrupt or ask later, whatever you prefer. There generally are three ways that an organization can run. And I would argue that part of the problem with critical infrastructure is we're usually stuck at the first, and if we're lucky, the second, but not the third. The first idea is compliance. So what compliance really means is that somebody else is telling me what good enough is. That's a great theory, right? The theory is that somebody else will tell you, you know what, you can't be worse than this particular point. And so you keep doing what you do and you keep getting better and you're just leaving those in the dust. But the problem is that compliance is about fear. Compliance is about somebody else getting to decide whether or not you're compliant and usually fine you or cost your reputation if you're not. So subtly on the human side, what compliance really means is that an organization is giving away control of their mission to the regulator, to someone else. So put another way, 
if you imagine this sort of vertical, um, the, you know, this um, in the vertical axis where the higher up you go, the better performing you are. The theory of compliance is it's just this floor that you'll never fall below. And if you do, there's kind of this force from the bottom pushing you up. The problem is we human beings add another force, which is the, the push down. If you're above that line and you have a way to go even higher, chances are there's someone in your organization saying, you know what, we're compliant. We're not going to spend money on that. That's a waste of time. That's a waste of money. That's adding risk. So again, we just skim that line. Reliability, we try to move further and just keep the system moving along nicely. Resiliency is really at the level of, since you can't guarantee that you will be able to be 100% reliable into the future, right? We will never build a power grid that will be fully able to not have any interruptions or damage due to severe weather, man-made attacks, or any of these other kind of things, right? We can't do that. Just like we can't build a human being who will never have any particular health problems over the course of, you know, infinity, right? But what you can do is in the resiliency world, look at how do we get back to good as quickly as possible. Now, when you think about that, it sounds like what I'm talking about is stressful. And we use the word in, our, in English a lot, stress. The Greeks recognized that stress is really two separate things. There is bad stress, which they called distress, and there is good stress, which they called eustress. It turns out that a lot of how we learn is going through good stress. When we build our systems to be stronger, and when we take pride and ownership in that, there are actually a lot of positive things that are happening in our brains and in our bodies uh, that make that better. One of the other things that you might have heard people say is that, you know, oh, I'm stressed out or I'm nervous, I'm going to fail. It actually turns out that when you look at human performance, if your stress level is too low, your chances of failure are pretty high. If you've ever been in a lecture where someone, I hope not me, is talking in the most boring monotone voice and your eyes are just struggling to stay awake, you are in hypo stress. We call it physiological arousal is low. Basically what it means is you are bored out of your mind. It is hard to be motivated. If it's hard to be motivated, it's hard to pay attention. If it's hard to pay attention, it's hard to form new memories. If it's hard to form new memories, it's hard to form situational awareness. So you can kind of see this cascade, how being bored can get you to a place where you have no idea what's going on. So I spent uh, just over 10 years at ERCOT. And when I started back in 06, 2 a.m. was an example of hypostress. At the time, wind wasn't such a big thing. And so you had this very flat load that you could easily predict, and it pretty much stayed the same. You had all of your generators humming along just the way that you told them to, because back in those days, most, if not all, of the power plants did exactly what you told them to, whereas nowadays you, have, you, know, the, you can't dispatch the wind. It, the wind blows when the wind blows. Um, but back then, 2 a.m. was really boring. Now, when stress gets too high, you're in what we would call hyperstress. And what that means, you know, if you've ever suddenly like gotten really, really scared all of a sudden, what do you do? You try to jump to the first solution you can possibly find. You want to solve your immediate pain right away. You're not thinking about long-term consequence. You just want to get through it. So now put those pieces together for that operator. Back in 2005, let's say, for example. It's 2 AM, boring. There's nothing even good on TV, right? And you're stuck staring at the screen where nothing is changing and nothing is changing. And by the way, it's 2 AM. You're really tired. Stuff on the screen starts to change, but not a lot. And you kind of don't notice it because you're bored. And then all of a sudden, something fails. Alarms start popping on your screen. Back in those days, everything was audible, so things are blinging and blonging left and right, and things are flashing up on your screen, and suddenly the operator's panicked. They have no idea what's going on, hypo stress, low situational awareness, and they want to make a decision right away. They want to hit that button right now to get out of that. That is the worst possible situation we can set our people up for. We're also, as human beings, 
when you're thinking about the ways that we could make mistakes. Everything about the system that we're looking at is really a result of human behavior. We've built, tested, installed, provisioned, maintained, and so forth. Everything, physical systems, software systems. And one of the things that's starting to happen that I'm observing is that the growing weakest link is in the interface between the human being and those systems. So let me give you an example. Let's go back to that ERCOT situation. Or frankly, to all grid operators, um, you know, as we've watched wind integration grow and grow and grow. It used to be you had a couple of key systems. For those of you who are in the power world, you know about things like contingency analysis and state estimation and voltage and transient stability, a couple of systems. Each of those systems were running on different servers. They had different UIs. And so in order to get all that stuff, what do you do? You build a bunch of wall boards in the back and a bunch of monitors in the front. Maybe, you know, three, four monitors. Now, you've added wind. Well, you're not just looking at wind. You need systems that are going to um, analyze that wind in real time and tell you what's happening. And now you need new forecasting systems, you know, machine learning algorithms to figure out where is the wind going to go in the next hour. Guess what? Those are two more vendors with two different systems, two different UIs. Now let's add solar to the mix. Now let's add, you know, IoT, controllable electric vehicle charging, and all of the emerging tech that we're talking about. What happens? We keep adding more and more and more siloed systems, and each of those systems has different UIs. So imagine that for the human being. How do we solve that problem? It's pretty simple. Add another monitor. Add another monitor. What we don't factor in is the way the human visual system works and that human stress system I talked about. So now I've walked into control rooms with operators with 15 monitors all around them. And by the way, companies spend millions upon millions of dollars for those big wall boards off in the back. I've read studies that show that less than 5% of the time will an operator actually look at that wall board on a 12-hour shift. We're spending millions of dollars on something that they're not even using. Now, I'm not saying wall boards are a waste of money. There are other reasons you want them, but not for the operators. We also have to start to understand that human mistakes happen in a lot of different contexts. If you've ever seen a baby learn to try to walk, what do they do early on? They fall constantly because they don't have the habits. They don't know the patterns of what good looks like roughly 50%. Eventually, as they get better, they start to figure out rules. So for example, I'm using a rule to walk across this, this floor. But if I were to come up to these stairs over here, that rule won't work anymore. I need to learn how to move my foot up when I want to go upstairs. If I don't do that, I'm not going where I want to go. And by the time that you move to the level of expertise, you're looking at about a 1 in 10,000 error rate. That's really great news because the better you are at something, the less you are likely to make a mistake. But let me ask you this question. Have you ever had that experience, say you either work in the office or you're coming to school, you know, you get in the car on a Sunday and you're driving to the grocery store and your favorite song comes on the radio or you get a call from a friend or something like that and before you know it, you're at school or the office. We've all done that. What happened was we were in expert mode we had a lapse of attention, and because running in expert mode means it's no longer effortful for us, in other words, we can literally be on autopilot for large amounts of what we do, attentional, um, attentional lapses lead us into the wrong situation. Here's another one, just kind of trying to go through at a high level some challenges you'd face in this world. So imagine that I'm telling you I'm going to put this bowl of radishes here in front of you. And your job is to just sit here and not eat radishes for 20 minutes. How many of you think that's probably pretty doable, right? Anyone really like, man, I love radishes, favorite food? OK. Yeah, probably not. Now, let's say instead this was freshly baked warm chocolate chip cookies. Like, ever walk past a Cinnabon on an empty stomach? You know that feeling? How many of you think that's a little bit harder? Yeah. So a psychologist named Roy Baumeister ran this experiment. 
and came up with this conclusion. He gave people this task, split them into two groups, don't eat this thing for 20 minutes, and then he gave them an impossible maze and just timed how long before they gave up. The way I'm framing this, you can probably guess that the people who didn't eat radishes were able to go for longer, about twice as long. Now, what he realized, he called it ego depletion, if you imagine squeezing a fist as hard as you can, eventually the amount of strength you can put into that squeeze starts to diminish. Self-control is like that too. It's a muscle that wears out. So let's put that into the control room context. What, have we what am I asking you right now? We have an unwritten contract here. I'm asking all of you to exert self-control. How many of you think it's a lovely day and you'd love to be walking around outside, right? I, I know I'm one of them right? But we're all agreeing to force ourselves to sit in our chairs. Imagine if you had to do that for 12 hours starting at, I don't know, 9 p.m. until 9 a.m. That self-control muscle might start to tire out. Imagine even further you're in that situation where you've got those 15 monitors all around you. One of the things that happens evolutionarily is that if you see something flash in your periphery or something move in your periphery, you sort of have this quick you know, jerk to the side and look at it. There's a reason we have that. Things used to fly at our heads a lot more than they do now. And back then, the ability to go, whoa, might be the difference between living to see tomorrow and not. Well, it turns out that that same area of our brains is active when we have a bunch of alarms popping off in our periphery, or we're trying to work and the TV starts flashing. Well, what do we do? We've learned, we've trained ourselves to ignore those impulses. So how do we do it? Self-control. What are we wearing out? Self-control. So one of the other things that happens is that those shortcuts like the ones I told you about early on um, can tilt some of our thinking. So let me tell you a little bit about identity theft, if you don't mind, because here's a great example. Okay, identity theft is a multi-billion dollar problem, affects people, I think they're saying now, um, one in 10 or more people have had their identity stolen. If it's ever happened to you, and I hope it hasn't, I know people it's happened to, it's an incredibly painful process. It's laborious, you're constantly on the phone, and you may never get your credit report looking as good as you want. But you don't have to worry, because there's a solution out there called LifeLock. So what LifeLock does is it actually monitors your credit reports. They are so good, their CEO is willing to put out ads on the side of the highway and on web banners with his personal social security number. That is how confident you can be in their ability. Anyone see a problem with this? Turns out, that in that room where the marketing people made that decision, there were several cognitive biases going on. There were several um, distortions in thinking that led them to make this particular choice. Turns out this guy's identity got stolen 13 times, I think, in one week. And even more interestingly, for those of you who have any law interest, one of the, one of the people who stole his identity was a child with Asperger's, and therefore, there basically the ruling was that somehow like, I don't remember how the wording worked, but he wasn't liable. So there was nothing they could do to recover the funds this kid had stolen, right? So how did we go from, you know, 20, 30 people, professionals in their, you know, at the peak of their career in a company that is designed to protect identity to come up with the idea that this was really genius? They thought it was. You can read about things like groupthink, stovepiping, and other cognitive biases. And if you're interested, there's some you know, real high-level summaries on places like Wikipedia, and I can recommend some books if you're interested. But these things we carry around with us every day. It's really important to keep track of them when we make decisions. I just want to highlight this study as well really quick because I think it highlights something else really important. How many of you know what an eye tracker is? Okay, so just at a very high level, when you look at something, your eye does this saccade, which is basically zoop, 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 looking, you know, moving around really quick to focus on different information. 
And you can measure that. You can use cameras to point back at the eye and figure out what people are looking at. You can do it with websites. You can do it at faces and all this other stuff. So they did this study where they took two groups of people. One group was particularly racist. The other one wasn't. And they showed them pictures of faces of other races. What they found was that the racist people spent less than 10% of the saccades of the non-racist people. I'm oversimplifying this a little bit. But if you've ever had the pleasure of talking with someone who's a bit higher on the racism scale, anyone ever heard, they all look the same to me? Right? The reason is not because they all look the same. The reason is the person who is looking has already completed a calculation in their mind that it's not even worth doing more deep analysis. Right? How does that shape what we look at on our desks? It turns out they've done all of these eye tracker studies as well, asking people, you know, which transmission lines are more overloaded? Or look at this scene, you know, how wealthy are the people? How old are the people? Why are the people there? And with each question, the patterns of where the eyes move and the number of saccades changes. So even before we start to look at something, we kind of have a plan on why we're looking at it. And if that plan is wrong, we're not going to get the information we need. We also live in a world that's kind of encouraging us to do more and more multitasking. And I put that in quotes because actually there is no such thing as multitasking. What there is is called switch tasking. What that really means is that I have a mental set, which is sort of like right now I have a mental set of presentation. If I were to drop this and I need to go pick it up, I need to do what's called a mental set shift. Okay, stop the presenter mode for a minute. Now I need to go figure out where did I drop this, pick it up. Okay, now I need to shift back. If you look at the amount of energy it would take my brain to do that kind of work, it's very effortful. And it turns out that the risk of my making a mistake in this realm is very high. Another interesting fact, the time you're most likely to forget what you were just thinking about is when you walk through a doorway from one room to another. So we're constantly doing this, connecting ourselves to our environment. Again, how does that affect control room operations? Every second of every day. Now, I'd like to just take a quick second and show you these four pictures of these brains, because they tell a really interesting story. One of these brains, and I'm not going to tell you which one is which, but I'll ask you to guess. One of these brains is a person who's watching a video of another person get hurt. One of these brains is a person who sees an unfair situation in the workplace and decides, you know what, I'm going to take revenge, even though they will fully admit it's not in their best interest. One of these brains is a combat veteran with post-traumatic stress disorder. While he was undergoing the scan for a different kind of study, he had a flashback to the moment that he was shot multiple times and on the brink of death. One of these people is afraid of losing their job. Can you tell me which is which? Anyone? This one? Uh, yeah, the second one from the uh, um, my left. This one? Yeah. Um, because wait, of the wait, intensity? No, the, no, the one with the two red circles. OK. There. I couldn't see your pointer. Sure. Actually, um, so th thank you. Actually, that's not correct. It's this one over here. These are on different scales. But the point is, they look pretty similar, right? So let me just share that concept again, just to kind of highlight that. The, person of the, the, the brain scan of the person who's afraid of being killed and the brain scan of the person who's afraid of losing their job looks pretty darn similar. Now, for those of you who know anything about the brain, you'll notice that there are areas of the brain where higher order reasoning, self-monitoring, self-control, empathy, long-range problem solving, None of these brains are lighting up on that. So if you have someone who works in an organizational culture where people are constantly afraid of losing their job, they may show up for work on time. They may punch in and do what they need to do. But if you want them to be creative, if you want them to solve a long-range problem, if you want them to collaborate to solve a problem, you've just set them up to fail. And one of the points is that human failure is part of the system. Human beings make between five and seven mistakes every hour that they're awake and between 11 to 17 mistakes when they're under extreme stress. 
There are some people who now argue that in very specific circumstances, it might be as low as three. That's a little bit confrontational. But even still, for every hour that you're awake, you will make at least three mistakes. You probably won't even be aware of them, and most of them won't have much consequence. But one of the other things that happens is this stress I'm talking about affects your ability to remember things. It affects your ability to pay attention to things. So it's both placing new memories and retrieving those memories that starts to fail. And like this other brain, sometimes you have insider threat problems that you're worried about. Because if you have inequality in the workplace, yeah, you may have people who are afraid of being fired and you might have people who decide to take revenge. I'm going to skip over just in terms of timing. Um, I just want to give you uh, two more high-level concepts. One, I'd like to ask you this question. How many of you have heard this phrase that's attributed to uh, Deming? What you can measure, you can manage. Anyone heard this? Right? It turns out that most people, and, and uh, please forgive me, MBA students, most people who have been to management programs, say, up until maybe a few years ago, heard this nonstop. In fact, I would bet money that there are still professors today who will say this phrase. But there's only one problem. He never actually said that. And when you're talking about the organizational side, this is actually what he said. Let's give you a second to read it. So management of people is not something that you can put metrics around necessarily. And there's another um, rule I was just reading about today. Um, is it a Goodwin's Law, I think? Which is that once you are making management decisions off a metric, that metric no longer is meaningful. Cultures are changing within organizations, and a lot of the things that we're starting to work on are becoming more resilient, understanding where those errors occurred that almost turned into those big events, but maybe didn't. We're trying to find how do we empower the human beings to get the most of those human capabilities. Because at the end of the day, it used to be, for example, we'd build a nuclear power plant. What did we build the plant to do? We built the plant to protect the plant from the human being. There's the old joke of that red button that says, do not press, and we expect the human being to go like that, right? It turns out that when things are going wrong, the resiliency actually is coming from the human side. It's going to be the human being who jumps in when the automation fails who's going to save our necks. Why would we have those people out of the loop? Um, one of the things that I'd also like to just do is take a quick second to show you another issue that leads to a lot of these challenges. It has to do with inequality in the workplace. What we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side, and if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. If you give them grapes, it's a far better food. Uh, then you create inequity between them. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task, and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does. And she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. Okay. Now, I, I, I had a friend say that he, um, she loved these videos with the capuchin monkeys because it kind of describes what we all want to do on the inside, but we're too well socialized to not do. Um, and actually, what's really interesting is if you look at some of these studies with the monkeys over long term, the monkey who got the grape, which was like the better thing, um, actually started protesting too. And the monkey who got the cucumber, I don't know if you noticed that part at the end, but their performance started to go down. They were just supposed to pass the rock back. 
and they started doing other stuff with the rock. If you look at that in a variety of contexts, what ends up happening is that the performance goes down for everyone. Well, you create an equality in organization, people are just biologically predisposed to be incredibly frustrated with that. And before you know it, you have a brain of a person who's deciding things are unfair and maybe even taking revenge. You certainly don't want that. You focus on starting to understand that if we're going to deal with problems after they're really bad, that's going to be really expensive. But if you start to dig deeper to where the problems haven't really happened yet, it's going to be much more cost effective. That's called the near miss. Understanding when something bad almost happened, that is your best indicator on what barrier you can make better, what procedure you can improve, etc. And by the way, that person who makes the near miss, if they report it, they are your expert on that error. They are doing your company a tremendous benefit. That's the exact opposite of the person who's afraid to be fired, right? Because they would just sweep things under the rug. So I realize I've kind of gone at a very high level across a wide variety of topics. But I just wanted to show some of the concerns that come when you're looking at what I would call the complex socio-technical system. You have all of your technical stuff, your grids, your relays, your technologies, your software, your monitors, and you have your social, your human side of things. If anyone is interested, by the way, ask me the, uh, ask me the Black Start uh, uh, lunch story. It's kind of a good one. Um, but there are lots of ideas that when you look at that system in that way, you're really looking at a co-optimization problem. You're no longer just trying to maintain the optimality of the grid, for example, but you're also trying to maintain the optimality of the human. And as you start to pull those things together, so for example, bring physical, cyber, human, all in line, that's really where you create resiliency. So I'll leave you with just one parting thought. The idea was to link this into the emerging technology and smart grid world. So I'd like to kind of leave you a bit of an idea, but not all of it, because I hope that will um, be interesting if you think about it more. But one concept is that as you look at this emerging technology and the smart grid and everything else, as you're looking at all of these different systems continuing to grow out, how do we create optimality anymore? Well, if you have an operator, for example, who is getting their energy management system is giving them a problem and a solution, and then you've got an emerging tech system that's got another solution that might be better, better for the environment, cost effective, etc. Which one are they going to use? Well, there's something called activation energy. What you want is to transition them into having that level playing field so they're always picking the best tool. That's where a lot of this integration stuff comes from. It turns out everything from what they have for lunch to how safe they feel in their organization, to how you've built out their systems, all matters. And ultimately, pulling all of that together allows us to create this world of resiliency. So I thank you very much for your time, and um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Hi. Me again, guy with the... No, um, I was initially making my assumption based on the size of the area that in the brain that was being illuminated. I couldn't remember it, and the one on the far, far edge, I couldn't actually see clearly. Sure. Um, but I remember a study where they were, were um, individuals that had un undergone a lot of stress for a long time right. had that sort of characteristic. Right. So the... Uh, so this would be an fMRI, so it's really looking at sort of the real-time, um, you know, volumetric blood flow and so forth. But you're right, actually, long-term exposure to stress actually changes the structure of the brain as well. Um, you know, it's kind of like um, th there's a concept in neurology called kindling, which is that sometimes you do something that makes it easier for it to happen again, just like a person who's a smoker who every time they get stressed out has a cigarette it actually increases their receptivity to stress. So it makes it easier for them to get to the level of stress that would make them do that. And the same thing is here, too, on a structural level. So thank you. Any other questions I can answer? Or anyone want to hear a story? I've got stories. 
this is not an energy question, but it's a, something that sometimes bothers me about doctors that get trained and then have to work, say, 24 hours at a time. I hate staying up all night, right? But there have even been studies now that show that the number of mistakes, especially towards the end of the shift, really increases. Absolutely. But even in the face of evidence, there's still a lot of resistance from people in the AMA and everywhere to continue this practice. So there's kind of a tradition, maybe, sure. that goes against it. So how do you, um, how do you adapt and make the case? And, and how do large bureaucracies or things with traditions like that get changed over time in the face of that kind of evidence? Sure, that's a great question. And you're really talking about that complex socio-technical one. If you don't mind, what I'd like to do is tell that quick story. And at the end, please tell me if I've answered it. And if not, I want to make sure, because it, it should flow very well into that. One of the things that I did while I was at ERCOT, I'm not sure if you're, if you're familiar with the concept of black start, but basically the hardest thing you can do on a grid is start it back up after a complete blackout because the system is highly frail. Um, all of those relays that will, you know, for example, um, um, shut down the system uh, if the frequency drops too low. Well, you know, if you've got a megawatt of load and a megawatt of generation and you have one outage, you're under frequency very, very quickly. Um, or over frequency very quickly, et cetera. Um, and so part of what happens in ERCOT and all of the other ISOs is all of the market participants get together to do Black Star training. So originally that Black Star training was done with what are called one lines, which are like very detailed, like the inside of this substation and the inside of this substation. And the way operators would perform is kind of like, you know, imagine you woke up blind in a burning room, right? You're just going to run as fast as you can, and if you hit a wall, you're going to turn another direction, run as fast as you can. That's exactly what they did. So they brought on a tool um, that I wrote called the Macomber Map, which is a predecessor to this tool, Resilient Grid Map. And what happened was, uh, very quickly, their behavior started to change. What we found was that their error rates continued to drop. They started to use what we'd call emergent behaviors. Uh, meaning that they would start to do things that you couldn't have done just from going from one line to one line. But what I noticed was really weird was that the risk of losing an island, in other words, one of those black start failures I mentioned, was very high between 1 and 3 p.m. on days where they serve fried chicken and mashed potatoes for lunch. So this is kind of tying into your question because this is a socio-technical system problem, right? We've basically blacked out a grid because someone had fried chicken and mashed potatoes for lunch. Seems like that should be a pretty simple engineering problem, right? What do we do? We change the lunch, right? So yes, we did the kale salad. Yes, we did the lean pork and the you know, light gravy, cut down the sugar, cut down the carbs. That was the first time in Black Star training that they've gone for two days without a single recorded operator error. They record 100% of the system, which had never been done before, in less than 25% of the time. That's kind of the world we'd like to live in, right? But here's the socio-technical system part. How do you think those operators felt when their barbecue chicken and their fried chicken got taken away? Were they happy? No. So part of the interesting challenge then is how do you show them the relationship between the food and, um, and the risk? And even if, you know, the thing you don't want to do is take away their control. But even if they want the fried chicken back, once they become aware of the error or the risk, they'll start to create their own mitigations in place. Um, I have a slide in here as well that, that highlights on the fatigue side of things. Um, you know, I always like to, you know, make sure I'm getting these numbers right. Yeah, for every hour awake, that you're, um, for every hour after 10 hours that you're awake, you have the equivalent of a 0 .004 blood alcohol level in terms of risk. By the way, one of the other healthcare innovations that's happened, not only have um, for residents have they cut down on um, shift time, guess what a neurosurgeon is now required to do before they go do a brain surgery? Can anyone guess? Take a nap. No? Good guess though, not a nap. Play Xbox. Why? Because it turns out that this fine motor coordination is really important when you're operating on someone's brain. So why not give them a safe playground where mistakes don't matter to help prime the pump so that when they go into it, they're ready and less error likely. 
So I hope I answered your question. Thank you for going down that journey. So, hi, excellent. Good to see you again. Likewise. Uh, what did you. you do for two o'clock in the morning operators? How do you how do you combine and change the human machine interfaces so that people naturally have sure. something to keep them more awake? Or what were some of the tr not tricks, but sure. methods you deployed? That that's a great question. So uh, there are a few things. First off, you have to start with the right landscape. Um, so, for example, what I'm showing here. Let me just throw on too much stuff here. Um, if I were to ask you what the most heavily loaded transmission line is on the system, and let me also throw in some map tiles just to make it more fun, you probably couldn't do this. It's informational overload. Um, part of the idea, when you pull all this information together into a single pane of glass, and you start to give the operators control over what information they're seeing or not, and um, let's just say I'm filtering this down. So these are your most heavily loaded lines on the system. It's a much simpler thing now that you've controlled the system to see what you want. So the first thing you do is you're strengthening what we call the MMI, the man-machine interface. That term was made decades ago, so um, I don't tend to use it much. But that's the first thing you do. So you have a common interface they're used to using, and you keep building up the habits. When you're doing the switch tasking of going from screen to screen and you throw in the fatigue, that makes it more error likely. Um, the second thing that I did in that example was I actually built a game. It turns out that operators have, you know, the, the what's the term, the triple A personality. You know, they're very, very focused. They're very dedicated. They're also, let's be honest, a little bit competitive. So what did I do? I built a game, a trivia game. Guess which county has the highest bus voltage? Guess which unit has the most active megavar res uh, responsive capacity to help you with voltage problems. Which county has the most load? Which, uh, you know, which company owns this particular substation or transmission line? It's silly, but it turns out that we were able to take something that the operators naturally enjoyed doing, which was the fun part, the competitive part. We put gamification around it and then wrapped a situational awareness layer into it as well. So that's one way that we tried to solve that problem. Did I answer your question? Yeah, thanks. So my question's more entrepreneurship related. What led you to you know, create this map and then, uh, and then eventually go out, you know, leave ERCOT and take it on your own? Sure. Um, f well, that's a great question. So for me, um, I always like to think that I started as an entrepreneur and then moved to the entrepreneurial world after. It was really about, uh, it's the same thing that you probably will often hear, about recognizing that there was an unmet, unmet need, um, and then also feeling for me, um, sort of being a weird, you know, having a weird background kind of helped maybe a little bit, but recognizing there was an opportunity, um, having formed all of these strong relationships with operators who were really, I mean, frankly, asking for help, uh, and recognizing that this is not just an electric problem. You know, every critical infrastructure operator struggles with these kind of, you know, systems integrations, challenges, and, you know, all of your typical high reliability organizational risks when things go wrong. Um, so it really was kind of, um, kind of a recognition that I was fortunate enough to have had the background at the point in time and, and saw the need and recognized that I'd be able to do, sort of help people more if I, if I did it that way. I hope. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Or? Okay. So that was like my dad's story. Oh, really? Cool. What does your dad do? Cool. Oh, very cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, and to me, the, the whole point of all of this is the idea of the continuously improving, improving whatever, organization, industry, human being, myself, software. You know, if we have the approach that everything is continuously improving and there's always an opportunity to make it better, then we start to treat every piece of information that comes our way as that kind of opportunity. Um, so that's what I try to uh, uh, keep up with. So if you consider uh, humans in an organization, mm -hmm. uh, there will be a distribution in terms of motivation levels, capabilities, and also sure. what is perfect equality or perfect equal treatment? Uh, so that's a very good question. If so, I would say this. 
two things. First off, we human beings are wired to be very sensitive to risk. Um, there's something called the Lasada line or critical positivity ratio uh, that says that just less than three to one ratio, if I were to tell you, you know, you could win a dollar or you could lose a dollar, your response to the risk of losing a dollar is just shy of three times as much. So imagine now that you and I both work in the same company and, you know, you always drive your car on the property at, you know, the right speed limit and I'm, you know, probably 10, 15 over and I'm swerving and everything else and I, nothing happens to me because I'm a VP and you're a senior engineer, for example. And then you do it once and you get called into the HR director. What you've recognized is that we were both engaged in the same exact risky behavior with different consequences. And, and so th that's just one example of how those kind of things would happen. Much in the same way, um, here's another example. There's a fundamental shift that's starting to happen, which is that if you've got someone who goes into the substation and fixes something um, with their hands, who's the expert? Is it them? Or is it the manager in the back office who hasn't been to the substation in 10 years? We come from an industry that used to believe it'd be the guy in the back office. We're moving to the industry where we recognize it's actually the person in the field. But that would be another example of inequality. The person who knows the details is being passed over or has their opinion undervalued relative to the person in the back. Yeah. Did I answer your question? I wouldn't say that it's necessarily, I, I wouldn't say there is a perfectly equal treatment. I would say that if you look at it from a continuously improving perspective and you train your managers to recognize that this inequality is the cause of a lot of your challenges, um, then every time something comes up that um, indicates that, that's an opportunity to fix it. And if your culture is done right, you don't have to go searching for people to say, hey, how's everything going? People will come to you not because they want to complain about the other person, but because they see something as being wrong. So imagine those capuchin monkeys could actually talk out their frustration and solve the problem. So that's a great question. Are there cultures that are inherently better at these which part, the, the just culture or the high reliability side or any of it? Just any, any of it. <laughs> um, as a general rule, there's, there's something I didn't talk about, which is the idea, uh, a gentleman named Frederick Winslow Taylor, who figured out that, you know, if you want to speed up car manufacturing, instead of having like one expert build a car, you have one expert managing and 50 people doing these individual steps. Um, which used to work in manufacturing but now actually fails in cognitive work. Um, I could pay you a bonus to move faster if you're just putting tires on and it'll make you speed up. If I'm paying you to come up with new ideas and I'm offering you financial incentives, I'm increasing the risk of your making a mistake. Um, so the reason I'm giving you that piece of information is that on a holistic sense, um, trying to synthesize a few different pieces, what I'm thinking is that cultures that tend to be more collectivistic than individualistic. So, you know, what are we fighting for? If I've got a program and I make a mistake and you catch it, if you say, hey, Mike, there's a bug in this code, if we're individualistic and I'm competing with you, then you're attacking me. But if we're fighting, so we're fighting for control, this is my product, how dare you, as opposed to we're fighting for excellence. Hey, thank you, you just found something I didn't realize was there, can you help me make it better? Um, so that's one side of things. The other side is that in the Taylor model, that again has affected most of our business and is failing us in the information age, part of the idea is that people are expendable. So if you believe that people are expendable and you want them to just do their work, then you're not going to pull in their opinions, they're going to see injustice, you have more insider threats, all of those kind of problems. So I don't know that, you know, there may be some cultures that do certain pieces better than other cultures, but off the top of my head, I can't come up with any one that sort of says, you know, this is the example of how to do it right. You'll probably find lots of, of key areas that some, other, that some do better than others. I hope I answered that for you. That's it, I guess. Well, I guess you've satiated a desire for more questions, but I'm sure there'll be more to follow on later on when we go over to varsity. 
Uh, thank you again for coming. That was really insightful. And again, one of those areas a lot of us, certainly engineers like I, don't think about enough and certainly to get more involved in. Thank you, yeah. Michael. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all for letting me open up the fire hose there. I know that was a lot.